In a previous lecture, I showed you how we can use Lagrangian mechanics for variable mass systems. Now I'm going to show you how to use Lagrange mechanics to treat objects that are not necessarily variable masses, but whose extended shape so is not something that you can reduce down to uh, all of the mass being concentrated at a single point about the center of mass. So to do that, I'm going to talk about the physical pendulum. And so what a physical pendulum is, is Instead of having, so a regular pendulum, you have all of the mass concentrated at the end of a massless string. In a physical pendulum, instead, the The part that's hanging is not massless. So let's say this is a rod with mass m and length l. Now, if we want to do our Lagrange method, you need the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So if this were um, so we could write this in general spherical coordinates. And just by looking at our problem, we know that r dot's gonna go to zero and phi dot's gonna go to zero. So all we're gonna have is this r squared theta dot squared term. But now because this extended rod has mass distributed throughout it, not only is the mass moving but the shape of the rod is rotating. So because of that rotation, there has to be some kinetic energy due to that rotation. And we write that as I omega squared, where I is the moment of inertia. So I've shown you previously how to derive the moment of inertia for uh, different shapes. And so I'll just skip ahead and say what the moment of inertia of this rod is. So before we do that, this omega squared is the angular velocity of this rod. Now, if we look at the position of the rod at different times, we would see that the, there's an angle that the rod goes through theta. And as it turns out, the angular frequency of the rod is going to be theta dot. And so our um, kinetic energy has two theta dot contributions. 
Okay. And furthermore, um, so let's write what we had one half m r squared theta dot squared plus one half i theta dot squared. So this first term is due to the motion of the center of mass. And so therefore r is going to be the position of the center of mass. This kinetic energy is due to rotation about the center of mass. Or in this case, some point that is shifted away from the center of mass. So the position of the center of mass R, if we looked at our picture, so the length of this thing is L, and so the center of mass would just be at a position L over two. So R equals L over two. So now let's look at the moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia about the center of mass for a rod equals the rotation for a rod about its center of mass is 1 12th ml squared. So if we plug these terms into our kinetic energy, we get 1 half m times L over 2 squared theta dot squared plus 1 half m L squared over 12 theta dot squared. Okay, so one over two squared would be one over four and then times another one over two would be one over eight m l squared theta dot squared. Now we have one half times one twelfth, which is one twenty fourth m l squared theta dot squared. So we just need to add one eighth and one twenty fourth. 1 eighth is 3 24ths, add another one that's 4 over 24, which reduces down to 1 6 ml squared theta dot squared. Okay. Now we have our kinetic energy in an easier to write way. Now our potential energy. And use the same argument that we've been using for the pendulums before. If this is the angle theta, then we're interested in this height, and that height is going to turn out to be L times 1 minus cosine theta. But remember, we are interested in the center of mass position and so the center of mass position is this L over two. So if you wanna know the height that the center of mass has changed, you do L over two times one minus cosine theta. So V is L over two times one minus cosine. 
Okay, so now your Lagrangian, it's T minus B, which is one sixth ML squared, theta dot squared minus L over two times one. Clear. So this is just the height, and then you have to multiply that by MG, MG L over two times one minus cosine. Okay, so now we have everything in terms of theta and theta dot. So we can start taking our derivatives of that. So this was our Lagrangian. So the partial derivative with respect to theta dot is one third ML squared theta dot. And then if we take the time derivative of that, we get theta double dot. Partial derivative with respect to theta is negative. So we're taking the derivative of positive cosine, which becomes negative sine, so negative mgl over two sine theta. So writing down our Euler and Lagrange. Which is this. get one third ML squared theta double dot equals negative mg L over two sine theta. So you notice the M's cancel, one of those L's is gonna cancel. And if you wanna write theta double dot by itself, you get negative three G over two L sine theta. Now for small angles, the small angle approximation, sine of theta is approximately theta. So this becomes theta double dot equals negative three G over two L theta. And so this is exactly the same form as the harmonic oscillator, only now, we have a three over two. So our resonant frequency is square root three G over two L. And so if you compare this with a simple pendulum, So a simple pendulum's resonant frequency is just square root G over L. So you'll see that the resonant frequency now is a factor of square root three over two larger uh, with this physical pendulum than it is with a simple pendulum. And so this is just uh, proof and evidence that when you can no longer reduce an object down to just a point mass, because it has some kind of extended shape, that uh, you get different answers than you would expect. So when I set up this problem for the physical pendulum, we ended up with a Lagrangian that looked like this, one half M, and r squared theta dot squared plus one half i theta dot squared minus b. And so I said this part was due to the motion of the center of mass. 
And this part was due to the rotation about the center of mass. And for the physical pendulum, you may be thinking, and rightly so, that this is not rotating about the center of mass. It's rotating about a point shifted away from the center of mass. And if you wanted to solve this problem in this way, you could. But you would have to write your Lagrangian with only the, so this would be the center of mass moment of inertia. And here you would just do the real center of mass. And so in our problem, this Lagrangian turned out to be one sixth ML squared theta dot squared minus V. And if we were to do the Lagrangian where we do the par parallel axis theorem and use that moment of inertia. So the parallel axis theorem says that we take our center of mass Lagrangian and we shift it by whatever distance. So from the center of mass to where this thing is rotating is L over two. So M times L over two squared. The center of mass Lagrangian is 1 12th ML squared plus ML squared over four. So one twelfth plus one fourth. So one fourth is three twelfths. So you would get four twelfths and four over 12 is one third ML squared. Now, if you plug that back into here, you see that you get one twelfth or one half times one third ML squared, theta dot squared minus V which is one sixth ML squared theta dot squared minus B. So these are the same. So it's just whatever way works best conceptually in your head. If you wanna treat the uh, Lagrangian as uh, only taking into account the uh, rotation of the object, and using the parallel axis theorem, or if you want to treat your Lagrangian as the motion of the center of mass and then the rotation about the center of mass, mathematically you'll get the same thing. And so this was a rather simple example, uh, and that's all that really is called for in this class, but uh, just to give you an idea of how this could apply to a more complex problem. Uh, we want to think about the moment of inertia tensor. And so a tensor uh, for what I'm talking about now just means a matrix. And so in three dimensions, that moment of inertia tensor is going to be a three by three matrix where the diagonal terms are the moment of inertia about the X, Y, and Z axes, or you could do R, theta, and phi if you wanted to work in spherical coordinates. And so these uh, diagonal terms are the ones that we usually uh, think about when we do, uh, for example, a cube or the rod example that I just did. Um, 
you're only thinking about uh, motion along one axis. But there are these other terms, these one, two, three, four, five, six terms. Maybe I shouldn't do. There are these other terms. And those other terms can uh, play a, an important role if you have some object, for example, that is tumbling through. You could imagine a shape that isn't uniform tumbling through the sky, or you could imagine a shape that doesn't have a uniform density, so parts of the shape are more dense than others. And then you would need to use this moment of inertia tensor instead of just the simple moment of inertia that we have been using. And so just like we saw with the physical pendulum, how that uh, incorporating something with an extended shape changes the uh, the frequency of a simple harmonic oscillator, you could imagine uh, a more complex shape where maybe these off diagonal terms are have an effect that could change the, for example, the frequency of your harmonic oscillator or the acceleration of whatever object is uh, doing some kind of motion that we can't reduce down to simple motion in say one or two dimensions. And so that's just a, a glimpse into what more complicated physics could be dealing with. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Peep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.